I think we'll get started. Thank you, everyone. Welcome. I'm Dr. Sally Blair, Senior Director for Fellowship Programs here at the National Endowment for Democracy. On behalf of NED's Forum for International Democratic Studies, it is my pleasure to welcome you to today's presentation, Why Women's Political Participation Matters in the Congo, featuring Reagan Fassell Democracy Fellow, Pasi Mubalama. We are delighted to have with us as a discussant, Rudy Masamba, Program Officer for Central and West Africa here at the National Endowment for Democracy. Funded by the U.S. Congress, the Reagan Fassell Democracy Fellows Program hosts some of the world's most dedicated activists, scholars, and journalists to conduct independent research and pursue projects here at NED. Now in our 17th year, the program has supported more than 270 fellows from over 90 countries since its founding in 2001. Within this remarkable group, our speaker today stands out for her unwavering commitment to women's rights and democratic values in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Despite participating enthusiastically in political and community life in the DRC, women hold few public decision-making positions. Many have withdrawn from seeking office or getting involved in public life, even though they are disproportionately affected by the civil wars and the resulting humanitarian crises that have plagued their country for more than 20 years. More than 800,000 people have been killed since 2000, and there have been 4.5 million internally displaced people in the same period. Human rights violations and violence against human rights defenders are a grave and ongoing concern, and it is with great sorrow that we note the deeply disturbing news of the death of Luke Kulula, Congolese pro-democracy activist and pillar of the youth democracy movement, Lucha, who lost his life in a fire in his home in Goma under suspicious circumstances earlier this month. In her presentation today, Pasi will share her experience as a former journalist and current human rights activist in the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. She will examine how the current political crisis affects women's rights in the DRC and why the participation of women in politics and security is vital for the prospects of bringing peace and democracy to the country. Pasi is a women's rights activist with many years of experience in supporting democracy, human rights, and the rule of law in the DRC. She is founder and executive director of Action and Development Initiative for the Protection of Women and Children, known as Ed Profen, an NGO that promotes women's rights in the eastern region of the DRC. In 2016, with funding from NED, she founded the Education Center on Democracy and Human Rights, which organizes trainings and arranges meetings between community and local party leaders in order to bolster women's political engagement. For her notable work to strengthen women's and youth participation in public affairs, she received an award from the Mandela Washington Fellowship for Young African Leaders Initiative in 2014. Rudy Masamba is a program officer at the National Endowment for Democracy, where he oversees grants program for several countries of Central and West Africa, including the DRC and Cote d'Ivoire. Before joining the NED, Rudy worked at the National Democratic Institute, NDI, on portfolios that also encompassed Central and West Africa. He holds a BA in political science from Binghamton University and an MS in international affairs from Florida State University. We will now turn the floor over to Pasi, who will speak for approximately 25 minutes, maybe a little bit longer, followed by Rudy for about 10. If you have not already done so, please silence your cell phones. And for those of you on Twitter, you can follow the presentation and contribute to the conversation by using the hashtag NetEvents or by following the forum at ThinkDemocracy and the endowment at NEDemocracy. Finally, let me take this opportunity to thank the many staff members who have been involved with this event, but most especially research associate Kabod Mensa, who has offered vital assistance to the fellowship project and today's presentation. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you so much, Sally, for the introduction. Uh, my name is Pasimu Balama. I'm a pro-democracy activist and a human rights activist based in Goma in the Democratic Republic of Congo. Uh, today, I want to share with you my story. Uh, I wish I could share with you a story of peace, but you know, unfortunately, I, I would share with you a story of war and the conflict uh, from where I come from, the Eastern Democratic Republic of Congo. I, I was born and raised in Goma, in North Kivu, uh, a place ravaged by civil war and humanitarian crisis. We have a huge, huge humanitarian crisis with uh, so many internal uh, displaced population. Uh, North Kivu is often seen as a place of war and the conflict. And uh, unfortunately, so many people are suffering because of the conflict. I have witnessed as a kid uh, poverty, human rights violations, rape, murder, uh, street children, and destruction you know, uh, around me. And uh, all which are you know, the consequences of war, um, in my hometown. Uh, this has led so, so many of my friends, my colleagues, uh, people in my neighbor, you know, to lose hope uh, and to not do anything. As you can see on this picture, that is uh, Congo. And the photo in green, you know, it's very, very nice, it's beautiful. Uh, that is a very, uh, like a uh, visage, another face of the DRC. I think most of the time people are never sure on media and everywhere, you know, it's like conflict and, you know, it's very, very difficult. But this is um, a place in Masisi territory uh, in Goma, and you know, it's very, very beautiful, it's very nice, and yeah, I think, as you can see, it's really natural uh, in the dry season, in the raining season, it's like all the time like that, it's very nice. Um, on the red on the map is North Kivu, and that is where um, I, I live. Uh, I, I will talk a little bit about my, about my family. I, I come from a very, very big family, as you can see uh, on the photo. Uh, my brothers and my sisters, we are 12. And I, I think on the photo we miss like two people. <laughs> uh, one girl and the boy. And the two children are, yeah, I think they are my sister's uh, kids. So uh, my mom in the white, in the middle, uh, she's extra extraordinary and very strong woman, you know. Uh, every year she had uh, a new baby and it was really like a tradition in her community to have babies every time. And most of women in my community was like, uh, taking care of ki of babies, of kids, uh, of the family, of their husbands, and sometimes having time for themselves, you know, it was very, very difficult. Uh, and because of marriage, my mom didn't finish uh, her high school. Uh, in the marriage, it was not easy, uh, as most of the time. Uh, and, you know, she was economically dependent to my father uh, because she couldn't work. She couldn't, for example, have a bank account. So it, it was just, you know, uh, difficult. Uh, my father, my father uh, was like most Congolese men. Uh, you know, most of the time the family uh, was not their priority or uh, is not their priority. And for my father, the family was not the, the priority, true. And my mom, you know, she wanted education to be a priority for her children, uh, you know, me and my sisters. And uh, I think she does, or she did uh, all the, her best, you know, to make sure that uh, we can have, or we can get a good education. And, you know, uh, she tried to make sure that uh, we can succeed in life. 
I, I remember I was only four years old when she decided to send me uh, to school. Uh, on the photo, that is me <laughs> at age of uh, four. And uh, when she decided to send me to school, uh, I was really excited to go uh, to school for the first time, as you know, most of kids uh, at my age. And uh, I, I remember entering uh, in the classroom. I, I felt, you know, very, very strange. Uh, strange because uh, it was very dark inside, no uh, windows and it was not clean, and I, I was like, oh my God, what is this? I, I can't spend my entire life, school life, you know, uh, in a room like this. And uh, yeah, I, I think I didn't like the school. When I came back home, I told my mom, uh, you know, mom, I, I, I think I would not go back to that school. I refused to go to that school. And uh, in my classroom, you know, most of the time children, you know, they can't say no to their parents because it's like uh, a tradition. Uh, children have to respect their parents. But for me, I was like, uh, no, I know I have to respect, but with this school, I think I can't. I, I said no. And for me, uh, that is, I think, the first day uh, I started to work as a human rights activist. <laughs> because I think uh, as a human rights activist, we don't, uh, ha we don't have only to defend the, the right of others, but we have first to defend our own rights as a uh, person and as uh, women. So, yeah. Um, when I think it come the time to go to university, uh, my dad, you know, because he was like, uh, he has to decide uh, everything about uh, his children. And uh, my dad, you know, he decided to send me to Kinshasa, which is the capital of the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, to do what, you know, um, fashion uh, uh, designer, and I was like, oh my God, fashion designer. Fashion designer because uh, it, it's like a technical stuff and women in my community, they, they have to do, you know, like something like that, you know. And it was like a specific uh, field, education field uh, for women. Uh, and for me, I was like, no, I, 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 I'm not seeing myself as uh, a fashion designer, uh, like maybe a big manager or something like that. And my, my father, we didn't have the, the same vision about, you know, um, yeah, what I really like, I was really like want to become. Um, when he asked me to go to Kinshasa, I, I also said no, I, I couldn't go to Kinshasa. Because for my father, he was like, if you don't want to go to Kinshasa to do a fashion designer, that means I will not pay, I will don't pay um, the fees school for you. And I was like, yeah, because in the high school, you know, he did the same thing. And, you know, I was like, uh, I, I did fashion designer <laughs> in the high school, and he tried to convince me to do the same thing uh, in university, and I refused. I was like, no, I would not do that. Uh, I, I did management for development. Um, you know, it was like something which was in Congo. Uh, actually, I was trying to do journalism but uh, in Goma, in that time, we, we couldn't find a journalism school. Um, I, I think after that, uh, when I refused, you know, uh, I was considered by my father as a rebel because all the time I think I was like, I can't do this, I can't do that. And in my childhood, I witnessed um, so many human rights violations, women's rights violations too. And women, unfortunately, were suffering uh, because of all those customs and traditions uh, in my community. 
As a teenager, I wondered how I, I could try to change the situation of women um, around me and in my community. But because, you know, those women were just keep obliged to keep silence because of custom and tradition in my community. Uh, at that time, uh, my goal was, you know, to find a way uh, to change the situation and to make sure that, you know, uh, people ca can understand that as women, we have a certain statue in our community. And, uh, you know, I was trying to work a lot to make sure that the statue of women can be respected and that those women uh, who were obliged to keep silence, uh, you know, to find a way to express themselves about um, different problems they were facing in their community. And for me, I, I thought that a radio station was um, a good place, you know, to make sure that uh, women, you know, uh, could have access to, um, you know, could speak and express themselves. Um, that is me in my work, I think, maybe seven years ago, when I was working as a journalist, I think in 2003. Uh, I won an internship in a local radio station where uh, I trained before I started working. At that time, most of women uh, in my community, even those who were working um, for a radio station, uh, they were they are like cleaners and at the reception, and you know it was just difficult. And my editor in chief would not send me, for example, to the field uh, because he thought that it was very dangerous for girls, for women to go um, in the field. When I talk about the field in here in Congo, it's like uh, remote rural areas where you know we have so many uh, rebel groups, and it can be really dangerous for people to go there. But uh, I told my editor in chief that if men can go uh, to the field, why not women? Because you know men are person, and I, I believe that if men can survive there. Uh, women could survive too. Uh, yeah, so for him, it was like, you, you, you are a woman, you, you cannot go there, it's not safe for you, you, you have to be uh, safe. And I was like, uh, no, you know, you have just to give me a chance to go there and, uh, you know, I, I will show, through my work, you can judge me, not to judge me because of my gender, because I, I'm a woman, but you know, through my work, I think you can be able to judge me. And yeah, I, I think he, he agreed to change uh, his mind uh, on me. So uh, I was I have been able to go to the field, trying to cover uh, different subjects related to uh, politics, security, peace. Uh, I was able, for example, to meet and talk, have interviews with uh, rebel groups chief. You know, sometimes you know people fear a lot uh, to meet those people, but you know I was able to do uh, that work and. Uh, as a journalist, I was covering a uh, very, very difficult question related to democracy and human rights. And uh, yeah, of course, all those subjects covered by men and women, you know, they are just sensitive subjects. But you know, uh, with all the problem in Congo, I, I think as human rights defender or journalists, we have to talk to make sure that, you know, the situation can change. So I, I decided to change the narrative through my work. And you know, I, I think at the end, the uh, editor-in-chief was really proud of my work. And you know, because as a woman, it was, it was easy uh, for me to get interviews for, from politicians, for example, uh, who sometimes refuse to give interviews uh, to, 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 to radio station, but sometimes when it's a woman who are asking an interview, it's like, oh, okay, yeah, you know, you will just talk and, you know, we can have it. 
So working as a journalist was an important experience for me uh, to give voice to women, uh, but in the same time, you know, uh, to try to make sure that people can understand why it's very important to promote women's rights. And yeah, I, I was giving voice to voiceless in my community, but in the same time, as a female journalist, uh, there is so many problems, discrimination against women journalists, because most of the time uh, we are regarded by the community as prostitutes. And, you know, it's very, very difficult. I remember uh, some people in my community was calling me Dikedume because they, they were thinking that I was like um, a, a boy and a girl in the same time because uh, with my way to wear and you know, uh, uh, yeah. But you know, it was not like I was a boy, but the work uh, would allow me to wear like a boy because I should go in the field and try to, uh, to do my work. But when they were calling me, you can do me, I was like, oh, it's fine. I I'm just doing my work. <laughs> and um, I, I would like you guys to have a look on this photo. Uh, this is um, Ruchuru. Ruchuru is in, Mas in uh, North Kivu, is one of the territory. And the photo is really very nice, no? Yeah, I think it's very nice. But in the photo, you, you can see maybe, w yeah, we are, we are seeing differently. We have a family, they, they just come from, the, from their farmer. And uh, uh, we have the mom and the girls, you know, the mom, she carry, uh, the, 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 the wife, she carries stuff on her back, but in the same time, she has a baby on the, the neck. And all the people, you know, on the other side, you know, uh, they, ha they carry stuff and they, uh, yeah, they, they are working. And, and the man, you know, he's like the chief of the family. He has he, his bicycle, and um, yeah, the bicycle is empty. I mean, the back is empty, and he, he doesn't care. Even the wife, she has the baby on the neck uh, and the stuff on the back. You know, I think you know it's like strange, and I think this picture is you know the situation of women uh, in my country, the inequality, gender inequality in my country. This is that picture. And the situation, I think, is really very bad. I think men has to understand that uh, they have, you know, to support their wife and make sure that, you know, women's rights can be respected. Uh, that photo bring me here on barriers to women's political participation. And education, you know, is the key, as we said, but most of the time in Congo, parents still choose to send boys to school and not girls, you know, which leave them sometimes um, to early marriage or sexual abuse, uh, sexual exploitation. We have custom and tradition, uh, specifically religion, you know, where we have a system which excludes women. And, you know, sometimes when they are excluded, they, they just lose self-confidence and it's just very, very difficult. A another barrier is the economic dependence and exclusion uh, because of poverty and the uh, I will try to emphasize, you know, the, the power of money. And most of the time, men in my community refuse that they, their wife can work. Uh, because, you know, when you can work, you can have money. And when you have money, you have the power. And most of the time, they just refuse that women can work. And that is very, very difficult. Because when you are not working, you, you cannot, you know, develop yourself. You, can, you can't have projects. And it can be very, very difficult. Uh, the conflict in the region is very, very, uh, is a very difficult and a very big issue because the DRC has been in conflict for more than two decades uh, with like 70 armed rebel groups 
So uh, with all of that, you know, it's very, very difficult sometimes for women to participate uh, when in the same time they have to take care of the family and, you know, it's very difficult. Uh, because of the conflict, there are so many cases of uh, sexual violence uh, which are reported, sexual slavery, child sexual abuse, and I think it's just very, very difficult, you know, for, for women. The, the big uh, barriers is the corruption and impunity in, uh, I think, all the system in Congo you know, in the judiciary system, in the education system. Uh, the, the, I think for, my, for me, for my opinion, the um, internal system in Congo has to change to make sure that we can take into account, uh, you know, all this um, situation. Um, I would like now to talk a little bit, because I don't have more, more time, uh, about my work with Ed Profan. Uh, in 2011, when I was working for the Institute for War and Peace Reporting, uh, some cases of uh, sexual violence have been reported in uh, Mugunga IDP camp, uh, which is a, an internal displaced population in uh, my country, you know, within the camp, the different cases of sexual violence have been reported there. And for me as a journalist, you know, it was like, ah, okay, yeah, I think this is a good story. I have to report about this. I went to the camp for my work to report, but the time, you know, I met uh, all those women uh, in the camp, you know, when I took a photo like this, you know, it was very, very uh, painful. It was very difficult for me uh, as a journalist to just report about the situation and leave. I, I was like, I asked myself, uh, Passy, do you, are you only going to report about this and leave these women and children in this situation? Um, I, I couldn't because, you know, I was shocked by the situation um, and, you know, I, I decided to do something to support these women and children who are suffering. When I went back home, I talked to some of my friends, to people, and I said to them, uh, you guys, you have to support me. And some of my friends were believing in me and, you know, in what I was doing, promoting women and children rights. They decided, they decided to support my work. And, you know, I have been able to take some of these children in a, um, an orphanage, in a center, to take care of them, to give them, like, food, um, shoes, and, you know, to try really to support them. And that was good. I was like, oh, okay, I, I, I'm able to do something. And to also support those women who were victims of sexual and gender-based violence uh, in the IDP camp. Uh, I will talk a little bit about the pillar of Ed Profen. We uh, promote gender equality in Eastern Congo and we empower women and girls affected by conflict. We try to prevent sexual and gender-based violence. Uh, as you saw in the photo, you know, the, the, we have too much work to do. And uh, through the work, we are trying to reduce um, the inequality which exists actually between uh, men and women. We promote democracy, peace, and the respect of human rights. Uh, we also do advocacy work at the government level and also in the uh, international community. Uh, our achievements, we most of the time do monitoring of human rights violation. We uh, last year, for example, we have been able to produce a report on sexual slavery and child sexual abuse around mining sites in the Eastern Congo, in Masisi. Because, you know, uh, most of the time when we have mining sites, uh, we also have, you know, people working in the mine uh, trying to exploit uh, children and women, unfortunately, to abuse um, women and children. 
Uh, we provide psychological support to survivors of sexual uh, violence. We have, we have the orphanage to take care of children who have lost the track of their relatives and their parents during the conflict. And Ed Profan, you know, as Sally said, we have the Education Center on Democracy and Human Rights, where we make sure that, you know, women can have access to different resources uh, so that, you know, they can be able to participate, maybe uh, at different level, but also in politics, because I believe that uh, women in politics, you know, they can try to change the narrative, they can change um, the situation of women in the DRC. Ed Profen is also an active member of different coalition uh, because I think working alone is, is, is okay, it's fine, but when different organization, when women can be able to work together, that could help, you know, to try to change the situation and make sure that women's voice can be, um, can be heard. Um, uh, talking about my work, I will talk um, I will tell you the story of these ladies. Uh, her name is Acheni Fitina. Uh, Acheni, she is 35 years old, and she is a mother of nine children, you know. And she doesn't know the father, unfortunately, of the sixth child. Uh, you will ask me why, because she was raped by three armed rebel soldiers um, in her own uh, village. Um, when she has, she has been raped, she gets pregnant, and you know, she has the baby. And for her, it was really very, very difficult to talk about that situation, because uh, most of the time, if people know that you have been raped, uh, you can be abandoned, rejected by the member of the community. And Acheni decided to keep silence. But, you know, even you keep silence. Um, yeah, when you give birth, you know, the baby will maybe look very, very different to other uh, children in the, in the family. With, with the time, she decided to tell the truth to his husband. But the day he de she decided to tell the truth, uh, you know, I think that day was the beginning of so many problems in her life uh, because the husband were call he, he was calling her, you know, any kind of degrading name in front of children, asking her to go to find the baby fathers and eventually uh, told her he couldn't live with a victim of, of rape. So, yeah. Uh, the husband decided to leave Acheni because she, 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 uh, she was the victim. And that is the situation of most of victims of sexual violence. They can be rejected, abandoned uh, by their family. And um, I think when Acheni joined our small group of women, uh, you know, we have in um, Miragongo territory, we knew that it was very important, uh, you know, to try to make sure that Acheni can be um, independent and develop her leadership skills so that, you know, she could find a way to support herself, but also um, to take care of her children. And Acheni cases is not like a unique um, case in the DRC. It's a microcosm of a larger reality of women in DRC who are everyday victim of sexual and gender-based violence, victim of, of sexual slavery, and you know, so many things. The situation is very difficult. Ed Profen was able to meet Acheni's husband, uh, try to explain to him that it was important, even Acheni were, was victim of sexual violence, you know, to continue to love her, to, to support her. But, you know, sometimes it's very difficult for men in such situation to understand. Um, the process to unify the family was very, very long. When a family is destroyed by, by the conflict, it can be very long and, you know, it can be very bad. And the case of Acheni took us a very long time to make sure that the husband could understand why it's very important to continue supporting her, her wife. 
but with the time, you know, we have been able to put them together. And the husband understood that it was very important uh, to, you know, to continue to support her. So we have been able to unify them, and yeah, I think that is one of our success stories, uh, and you know, an example of the work we are uh, doing in the DRC. But this Acheni story is an example of sacrifice and hard work. Most of the time, peace builders and human rights activists uh, can face, you know, doing their work. And yeah, most of the time, ourselves as act, uh, human rights activists, we face difficult situation. And you know, it's very, very hard sometimes. Uh, the photo is uh, the children on the, on the center, the children we support. Um, and this is like one of our important program we have in Congo because you know promoting or empower women we it's good you know to have like um, training but we, we, we believe through sport we, we can really try to empower women and make them you know to feel uh, to have their mind open you know to feel free and this is uh, Masisi, and in Masisi we organize different activities, running, walking, hiking, and so many things, and it's very, very funny. And women and girls who participate in this program, you know, they, yeah, we, we can see the change, and you know, the way they feel confident after these activities during our discussion, and you know, we believe it's a very, very uh, good program. We also do training with women in politics, uh, so you know to make sure that women can have you know different resources and they can participate. Um, doing this work, we have different challenges, and I have talked about this before. And security in the conflict and the conflict um, in DRC is you know the huge the huge challenge with more than two decades of the conflict and 70 armed rebel group. Uh, the, the conflict between the law and the custom in Congo is very, very difficult because sometimes, you know, you, yeah, it's it just difficult because the law is clear about some thing, for example, women political participation, but the, the custom in Niragongo, uh, women cannot be local chief. And when they can't be local chief, you know, it's like that in their community. And when you come, for example, with, you know, the article tell, say that and that and that, they are like, oh, no, this is what we know since so many years in our community. This is how things work in our community. So this is a very, very difficult. The social decay with lack of trust in, among people um, in the community. We have so many violence because in Congo, you know, we have like uh, 300 tribes and most of the time those tribes fight, you know, against themselves sometimes for land, for uh, the control of mining and it's very, very difficult sometimes. Uh, gender issues are not priority for the Congolese government. There is no money allocated for gender equality in the national budget, for example. And even, you know, uh, women are 56% of the population. And when they try to exclude 56% uh, of the population, I think, you know, it, it's just difficult. We can't have development when, you know, we try to exclude um, the majority of the population. And also, donors focus, um, find on survival of sexual and gender-based violence, which is really very, very important. But I think, you know, we have to put uh, more funds you know, on preventing sexual and gender-based violence to make sure that, you know, we can avoid having uh, those kind of activities. Uh, we have uh, Congo fatigue. Congo fatigue, you know, people are just tired about the situation in Congo. 
they are like, you know, you guys, you have been in Congo in conflict for more than two decades, and since that all those time we have been able to 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 support you. Yeah, you know, I think now they they, they are tired, but people are still suffering, and I think uh, Congolese people need a particular attention to make sure that we can end, you know, this conflict which has been very very long. Um, to finish, I have different recommendations to the Congolese government. I, I don't know if they are here, but you know, it could be good. Um, to try to resolve the conflict between the Congolese law and the tradition, which you know is a very, very uh, difficult situation uh, in the country actually. Uh, the DRC has ratified, you know, different international law. Uh, I think it's very, very important for the government to respect, you know, all those um, international law which have been ratified. Uh, to prioritize gender equality and to make sure that women and children uh, can be protected. Uh, a recommendation to, civil so to the civil society, I think, as civil society members, we have to continue promote, uh, to promote women's rights, to develop projects, you know, which take gender equality into account. And for me, taking gender equality into account is not only the number of women we attend, we reach in the, you know, in the project, but we have to develop projects which reduce um, gender inequality, and in that way, you know, we can be able to reduce uh, and to make sure that um, women, you know, can live uh, their lives. Uh, we have to create an inclusive space of dialogue between uh, men and women. Because I think this is really important. Most of the time, we try only to work with women or girls, and we forget men. But you know, most of the time, uh, men in my country are responsible of so many women rights violations. I think we have to create this space to make sure that, um, yeah, together we can find a way to promote and support uh, women leaders in our community to make sure that women can participate. Um, the last recommendation is to the international community and donors uh, to allocate more funds, as I said before, to prevent sexual and gender-based violence in our community to keep pressing the Congolese government, you know, to fulfill its agreement to hold free and fair election. Because in Congo, um, the election actually at this time is one of the main problems which is responsible of so many uh, human rights violations, specifically in Beni, Lubero, and Ruchuru, where we have massacre of people, where people are kidnapped. Yeah, the situation is really very bad. I think we have to keep pressing uh, the Congolese government to make sure that, you know, we can have election. Um, and this one is like, um, yeah, a small poem. Uh, I, I wish it could be in French. I could, you know, like saying it uh, like in, in French. But women and girls, I, I really believe that women and girls are human beings. And women and girls are not victims. Are not, we are not victims as women. Uh, women and girls need to be given dignity and the opportunity to speak for themselves. Women and girls are autonomous actors uh, who can make a difference in their community. Women and girls should be recognized and given support by the government and their family. And the, the last one, we need to believe in women and girls. And by believing in women and girls, we can promote them, we can protect them, we can do everything with them. Thank you.
Patsy, thank you very much for sharing with us your personal journey, which uh, very much represents the situation in your country for women and girls. Thank, thank you. you. And I will now turn the floor to Rudy for his comments as discussant. Rudy. First, I'd like to uh, thank the forum and the Reagan Fussell Fellowship team specifically for organizing this discussion and giving me the opportunity to share my knowledge and thoughts on this topic. Second, I'd like to thank Basi, not only for her excellent presentation, but also for a great contribution to the fellowship team. For several years, we have struggled to uh, recruit a fellow from the DRC. She is our first fellow from the DRC, and uh, we certainly hope that she won't be our last. For the sake of time, my brief remarks will touch on one aspect of Passy's presentation, and that is addressing the institutional barriers to women's political participation. As many of you already know, for more than two decades, the Africa team has made the DRC a priority of our grants program. In recent years, we've devoted a modest amount of resources to uh, women's political participation. For example, since 2015, we made no less than 30 grants to tackle this issue. Most of them um, implemented by women-led organizations. So why women's political participation matters in the DRC? There are several reasons, but again, to save time, I'll name just a few. The first and most obvious one is the fact that women represent 56% of the DRC's population. A second reason is the urgent need to empower Congolese women to deal with issues they know best, female literacy, sexual and gender-based violence, domestic violence, child neglect, gender discrimination. The list is long, I go on and on, I can go on and on. The third reason I want to bring up is connected to the previous one. There is no better way to empower women than by electing a maximum of women to public office. How do you accomplish this? By encouraging political parties, encouraging and requiring political parties to field more female candidates. This is something I can add to Passy's list of recommendations. The way things are set up in the DRC, a woman needs the full backing of a political party in order to be elected, and sometimes that's not even enough. The new electoral law does not favor independent candidates, and besides, very few men, let alone women, have the financial means to do so. I will elaborate on this during the Q&A. To conclude, I'll say that an increase in women's political participation can revolutionize DRC's democratic governance. Since independence, men have failed miserably. So perhaps it's time to try to go in a different direction to give educated women a chance to rule. And that starts by creating the conditions for them to become more politically active. Thank you very much, Rudy. Well, we have much to discuss. Um, the floor is open for questions. If you could identify yourself and um, keep your comments relatively brief. Um, yes. Hi. My name is Lindsay. Lindsay Robinson, I'm with the National Democratic Institute. Um, Hello. Uh, hi. Passi, I've met you in the past, and as I mentioned, but um, when we met, uh, the National Democratic Institute, NDI, is training uh, women, potential candidates and candidates ahead of the elections this year. Um, and something that I want to have your thoughts on um, are what are the, the key um, recommendations or arguments that you can find to help women overcome the cultural barriers that they face? How can you help them convince their husbands and fathers and, and community members to accept that they're politically active? Oh, 
Thank you so much, uh, Lindsay, for the question. Uh, yeah, I, I think this is a very, very important question. Uh, how we can help women to overcome cultural barriers um, in terms of their political participation. Um, I, I think politic, um, cultural barriers, as I said, is really very, very strong. And most of the barriers we face, I think the big one for women political participation is the uh, lack of education, which is really very, very big, and also uh, access to different resources. For example, for those um, who like, who or who wish, you know, uh, to participate or to be candidates, most of the time they ask them to pay a caution, and that caution can cost, you know, a lot of money. And most of the time uh, in Congo, we have seen that um, all, all the time. A, a man candidates, you know, when he need like that caution, uh, you know, he, he can sell even, you know, their lands, their house to make sure that he can have um, those money. But when it comes to the wife or the woman, it, it can be very, very difficult. Most of the time women are not economically independent. And the fact that, the, the fact that they are not economically independent uh, put them, you know, to be, uh, to, to avoid some time to present their, uh, uh, to, to present themselves as candidates. So I, I really believe that if we try to encourage them, you know, to be economically independent, that could help a lot. But also, most of the time, we have seen that uh, women have the lake um, to access to different resources, you know, sometimes they doesn't know how, um, th what the constitution say about, you know, uh, women participation, and I, I think it's really very important to give them all those trainings and resources to make sure that, you know, they, they can understand and they can have all uh, language uh, to participate, yeah. Passy, to follow up, do you have an example of when you saw that men in the community were able to be convinced to allow women in their community to participate? Have you looked at that through Aid Profen at all? Uh, yeah, we, we work a lot, you know, in terms of political participation. I remember uh, one day in Ruchuru, um, we, not Ruchuru, Niragongo, we was in a, um, an activity and, you know, it was like a, uh, I don't know how we call it in, in English, in French it's Théâtre Ambulant, uh, Théâtre Ambulant. A local theater? A, a theater. local theater. Ambulant, yeah, Ambulant. Theater. Um, and, you know, we try to create like a kind of situation, you know, to make sure that um, people in the community can understand why it's very important for women to participate. And one man who was in, the, in that activity, you know, he asked me a question. Uh, Passy, what do you think, you know, he is like um, a motorcycle? In Niragongo we have those we call it chukudu. Chukudu is like a motorcycle, but you know, which is produced locally. And most of men in um, Niragongo, they use that motorcycle for transportation. And the, that is the work of that man. And he asked me the question, what do you think if, for example, my wife, she became um, a national, uh, a member of the parliament? Do you think she will keep, you know, respect me and give me the same love as, you know, yeah, I, I'm really poor. I'm not sure if she, she became like a member of the parliament who will have the same life. And yeah, you know, it was like a normal question, but I, I told him, um, if your wife, just imagine a second, if your wife is a member of the parliament, do you think you will stay in the same life? You know, she will be, yeah, uh, she will have like a 
tattoo in the community, and I'm sure she will try to help you and you know uh, to make sure that you will be okay. And she, the man was like, ah, oh, okay, I, I see, I understand. <laughs> so we need to try to work and try to sensitize people in the community, men in the community, to understand that they have to support men, women, their wife, and make sure that, you know, because if a, um, a, a woman can become a member of the parliament in the family, of course, she, she will support the family and, you know, it's for, it's the benefit, it's the the benefit of the family, yeah. Rudy, any thoughts? Um, um, Lindsay, it's a really good question. Beyond the cultural barriers, you also have to take into account the institutional barriers as I mentioned during my remarks, um, convincing men to allow their women, uh, their wives to be candidates is not enough. Um, you need to uh, convince the political parties to do so. There is no legal framework in the DRC that obliges political parties to field a minimum number of female candidates. There isn't. Um, if something that could be useful would be a, a zebra list, as we see in some countries. For every man, there is a woman running. Uh, DRC uses an open list, um, meaning that voters get to see exactly who's on the list. And most of the time, women are at the bottom of that list, so it doesn't really help. So that's something to keep in mind. Yes, we've got one here. Yeah, thanks a lot. Great uh, presentation, uh, Pasi, and thanks, Rudy, for your comments. Also, uh, my name is Sasha Lezhnev. I'm with the Enough Project here in Washington. Uh, my question for you is, um, if indeed we will have uh, elections uh, this year in Congo, what um, are your ideas to try to put more um, women's and gender issues on the map? Obviously, all the main candidates are men uh, at the moment, for president anyway. Um, so, but I uh, uh, was wondering if, if you have further ideas along the lines of, you know, getting into their platforms, if I, some of them have platforms I've seen, some of them I haven't seen, and we don't know what Bemba is going to do, of course. But um, uh, or or there are organizations like yours, or could you tell us some organizations that are planning to put out statements or press releases or um, events and so forth to make sure that um, women's issues are, are on the map in the political um, in the election process again if we do have elections in Congo. Thank you. Yeah, I think that is the big question if we will have election in Congo, actually. We are trying to uh, push, 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 and make sure, you know, that uh, the president can fulfill its, um, his own engagement to organize election. Because as I said, um, for people in Congo, um, the election is now a, a priority because because we don't have election. You know there are so many uh, human rights violations which are uh, actually committed. I, I think um, the, what we can do actually most of the time people wait uh, when we have election to uh, start, you know, uh, developing different projects on promoting women participation. But I think we don't have to wait uh, the day of election, you know, to start working on that. That, that is why, for example, with NED support, uh, we all the time, you know, develop different activities to make sure that um, even, you know, two, three years, a girl uh, before the election, you know, women can have access to different resources, can have uh, different training to, to make sure that they can have, you know, all resources they need. And, you know, to make sure that when the election will um, arrive, they can be able, you know, to respond, you know, they can be ready to uh, be um, not only as voters, but also present themselves as candidates or uh, can vote for other uh, women. Because, you know, the, the problem of customs in Congo, most of the time, even, you know, we have like two candidates uh, and we have a man and a woman, 
most of people, you know, they will not vote for the woman because they will say, ah, oh, no, uh, Passy, she's a woman. I know we don't want a woman. We just want a man. Even Passy has, you know, all criteria. Even she's the best of the candidates, you know, because of the customs. Uh, most of the time, they never just believe in women, and you know, it, it's very strange. I, I remember we have been in different trainings, and um, I, I was um, giving the training on leadership. And I was asking to um, the member of the community to give different uh, criteria to be uh, leaders. And you know, uh, for men, men and women, which one of them has you know all the criteria? And most of the time in all my trainings, you know, women are the one who has you know like all the criteria, you know, in the list. But when you ask them why they never vote or elect women as uh, leaders, as chief, they are like, oh, no, we, we don't know why. But you know, I think, you know, there are like uh, so many prejudice against and discrimination against women. And I think we have to work on that and try to change the mind of people in the way they consider uh, women. Yes, there's a question here, and then I'll go over to that side. Thank you. Hi, my name is Catherine Doyle. I'm from the Pulitzer Center. Um, and I was wondering if there was any sort of generational distinction between um, the ways that women are perceived in politics. The generational differences? Or younger Generation. Generational oh, okay. differences. I should speak in quickly. Yeah. 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 Generational differences in the uh, um, Yeah, I, I think we have a big uh, generation differences. Because I think the way, for example, um, in, in the civil society, for example, in Congo, we have like two uh, generations the, the, the one, the senior one, and the youngest. And even, you know, um, we, we have also different way to think about uh, our work and our responsibility as civil society members. And in, in that way, for example, you can see young people uh, are most of the time in different youth movements. We can go in the streets, you know, to try to advocate for our rights. But the, the um, senior uh, generation, they are like, oh, no, a civil society. Yeah, we can't do that, you know. We have to talk with the government. And I, of course, we have to talk to the government. But I think um, in the same time, as young people, we, we have a different way to see things. And uh, that is very, very important. I, I, I don't say that um, I don't support, you know, uh, the senior um, generation because we work a lot with them and we they, they help us a lot in terms of advice and how we can we can do our work. But I think we are it's like a com we are complementary and we try to work together, but we think differently and. Actually, I think with the new generation, um, yeah, I, I have hope that you know the situation in Congo can change uh, because I, I believe that um, the, um, the the future of Congo, the future of Africa, is in the end of youth, of young people, and so we have to work with both young people, men and women, to make sure that they can understand that they have to work hard to make sure that the situation in Congo can change. Uh, to add on to uh, what Pasi said, uh, the younger generation is, is definitely interested in entering politics. Uh, however, they confront a lot of uh, obstacles, I should say. Um, because of the total disregard, uh, you know, from the older generation, the lack of trust um, the older generation has for youth activists or young politicians. So it's it's not uh, it's not necessarily uh, 
lack of will to enter politics. It's more about opportunity, uh, and there are very few opportunities for for you to enter politics, to enter, to uh, get into positions of power. This lady here had a question. Hi, my name is Alve Martin. Um, je voudrais vous remercier d'être ici et partager votre expérience avec nous. It was really nice that you could just share everything that you um, have experienced in DRC with us, and I really appreciate it. My question is t to the women who are voting, what's the portion of the voting population that is women, and have you seen any trends as to them increasing or decreasing, um, or are there any workshops that you've been putting on to get them to be more participatory? and increase their civic engagement. Yeah, thank you so much for that question. Um, I, I really think the, uh, the portion is like 51% of uh, participation. And yeah, it's very, very important in terms of um, we, we really have to work hard to make sure that you know women can participate. With the net support, as I said, we have the Education Center on Democracy and uh, Human Rights, where we make sure that um, people can, women specifically, can have access to different resources. And with all those resources, you know, it's the way to prepare them to make sure that uh, they can read, for example, our constitution. You know, we have the constitution. I don't know the case here, but most of the time people, you know, they, they just don't know what is exactly in the constitution. But you know, it's like an important document. It's a key document. And we believe that, you know, people, um, have to know exactly the, the content of, of that document. So we organize, for example, different um, uh, activities where we try to explain different articles, you know, so that women can understand. And yeah, I, I think that is our way to make sure that women can have, you know, all those resources and they can participate. Of course, there are so many challenges but um, yeah, we believe that you know um, we, we are actually doing something with the support of our partners like NET, you know, to make sure that we can be able to change the situation. And do you notice um, women voting? Do you? Uh, what has been your um, experience? Women voting. Uh, I think the. The participation is still very, very low because um, most of the time we have like our carte d'électeur, uh, which is like a document we have to uh, to use as our national identity uh, card. Card, and we with that document, for example, people are obliged to go uh, to um, to the CENI. Um, um, to identify themselves. And uh, yeah, in that way they participate not only as voters, uh, they participate as voters, not candidates. And most of the time when they are candidates, they are not elected um, you know, by the member of the community because uh, most of the time they just don't trust in them. And we are trying to work to make sure that, you know, we can change the situation. Uh, and it's very, very hard and difficult. But, you know, because, you know, changing a, a system, changing a custom, a tradition can take a long time. So we, we try uh, to work on it, but, you know, it's not easy. Frank, can say a few words about oh. women's voting in your view? Well, the women's participation in, in the electoral process, if, if the turnout levels among women is low, it's, it's not because they lack the information about their rights to participate in that process. It's more about, at least uh, from my experience uh, dealing with civil society in the DRC, it's more about um, being disillusioned with, with the system. Uh, what difference is it going to make whether we vote or not? And this is why grantees have been organizing a lot of awareness campaigns 
town hall meetings, um, any activity to encourage citizens to vote, women and youth, all segments of society, because it's an important step in the democratic process. It's certainly one step towards making the DRC a more democratic country. So it's it's not really about not having information about about their their right to vote. It's just because they they don't they don't feel like it will make a difference. Thank you. Xerxes Spencer. Oh, I see many hands. So let's take a couple of questions. Patsy, thank you for your very eloquent presentation. Your resilience and your perseverance is incredibly inspiring in the face of all the challenges that you face in the DRC. I wanted to ask you, I think you're absolutely right that boys and men are a big part of the problem, but to what extent do you find that women and girls are also a part of the problem? To what extent have women and girls internalized the patriarchy that has been passed down from generation to generation, such that they themselves believe that their own role in life is simply within the four walls of their home, and how do you and Ed Profen seek to combat that? Um, you are a tremendous inspiration to the girls and women of your country, and so my other question is, from where do you draw your inspiration, and how can models of leadership for girls and women be cultivated so that they can assume positions of leadership within and beyond the four walls of their home? Thank you. Thank you, Zixis, for the question. Um, yeah, I, I agree with you. I think um, men are not, the, are not only the, the problem. The, the problem is also women. As you said, most of the time, you know, um, they, they, they themselves, you know, they are like, oh, yeah, we have been trained, raised in this way. Uh, as women, you know, we cannot work, you know, we, we, we just depend on men. And most of the time, for example, women, uh, even they, they have like a degree in, I don't know what, but you know, they are like, oh yeah, I will wait and my husband will be working and you know, he will take care of me and my family. I, I think um, all my work, the, the work I do in Congo is, you know, I have so many meetings and conversation with girls because you know, most of the time working with senior, it's like yeah, adults, it's good. You know, they can change, but to change them is very, very difficult sometimes because, you know, they've been raised in that way. But uh, those ones who are young, the young um, women, girls, you know, I have different meetings with them and I, I try to share with them my experience to explain to them why it's very important for them to become economically independent. And, you know, uh, yeah, I, I think through all those conversations, I have, uh, for example, mentorship programs, you know, when I, I try to push some, giving them um, different advices on, you know, how uh, they can succeed. Because, you know, the problem is that most of the time, um, people really believe in marriage. I, I don't say that, you know, I'm not okay with marriage, but, <laughs> but you know, at age of 18, 19, 20, most of the time when just they finish with the high school, the la first thing to do is to get married. And, you know, with the situation in Congo, when you are married, that means um, you, you cannot go to school, you, you can't uh, continue with university. It's very, very difficult. So uh, I, I say to them, of course, you can love someone, you can do whatever you want, but just keep finish your school. And when you have done with school, you can get a job and you can get a man who will really love you and you can live with that person. <laughs> Carol. <Very nice. laughs> and uh, of course it's not, it's not easy to convince them, but you know, I try to explain to them. <laughs> and yeah, I, I think there are some uh, who actually understand that it's very important for them to be uh, economically independent and then get married. 
So I saw several hands, so what I'd like to do is allow everyone to ask their questions so that we get the range. So this lady here, that gentleman. Okay, we, we'll just let the mic go around. Um, hey, um, so I am an intern in the Wilson Center, um, the Global Women Leadership Initiative. Uh, my name is Yue. Uh, so my question is that you mentioned that there are a lot of, um, so families in Congo tend to be large. They tend to have um, a lot of children. So I'm just wondering that um, how do uh, women who want to participate in politics strike a balance between life, um, between family and work. What are some good strategies that you have been, um, you have seen and what are some examples that might be um, instructive on that problem? Yeah. So we'll just, we're going to take a number of questions okay. since we're okay. running out of time. And this, yes, this lady and the gentleman. Hi, um, my name is Elsa, and I'm a fellow at the U.S. African Development Foundation. I would like, I, I'm sorry if you already answered this question, but I would like to know if people's perfection, um, perception that there may be voter fraud deter them from voting. Okay, voter fraud. Voter my fraud. And this oh, okay. yes. um, my name is Resla, I'm an intern with the Africa team here, and my question is for the women who are running for office, uh, what kind of strategies are they doing to ensure their campaigns are much better despite the prejudice that exists and how are they accessing funding even if they're losing and what are they trying to do better if they try and run again? Okay, so those are three pretty big questions. Maybe we'll take those and then on this side of the room there was one here. So let's, let's take these three and then we'll have one more round. Yeah. Um, so the large family striking a balance Voter fraud, is that a deterrent? Do people feel that it's corrupt, the system? And also strategies for campaigning, yeah. getting funding and overcoming barriers. Um, family and work. Yeah, I think all the time it's very difficult to deal with the family and work. Uh, usually when you, uh, when you have uh, so many children, it can be very tough, very difficult. But I, I think um, no, nothing is easy in the world. <laughs> and uh, when you want to work, you know, I think you can find a way to try to find a solution. Of course, uh, children need the attention of their parents. You know, parents have to be there. Uh, to make sure that they have the good education and yeah. But I, I think working, you know, is also very important. I, I know, for example, here in the US, you know, you men can work and women can work, you know, it's like complementary. But in Congo, most of the time, women are the one who have to take care of children who have some time to work. I, I think, I, I, I can't say that women doesn't work in Congo. They, they work, uh, like, you know, to go to the farm, you know, it's a kind of work, but, you know, the resources they get from um, the farmer, it, from the farm is um, used most of the time by, by men, which is very, very bad. But I think it's very important to balance, you know, um, between how to manage kids, and how to uh, try to make sure that you can work and be economically independent. Yeah. Um, the second question is about the fraud vote. Uh, voter fraud. Uh, I think this is a big reality in Congo. Most of the time I remember in 2011, uh, you know, we were like, ah, yeah, this is not the reality, and you know, it, it's like politics, and you know, the situation can be difficult. And, and most of the time, um, women can be afraid, you know, with that kind of system, which you know, uh, is designed by corruption and you know, so many problems. And that is why um, when we promote democracy and try to do advocacy um, in, 
uh, at the national and international level to make sure that you know we can have a system which uh, protects you know uh, population and avoids um, those kind of uh, of fraud uh, during the election. In DRC, for example, we have actually the machine à voter. Uh, yeah, I, I think people think that that machine could be responsible of so many frauds during the uh, election. And uh, unfortunately, for example, um, all those older people in Masisi, in Beni, I, I think using a phone is very difficult. I don't know how it can be possible for them to use uh, that kind of machine. But you know, even it's a manual one, most of the time there are um, uh, frauds, and I, I don't know how we can avoid that. Actually, I don't have an answer to that question. Maybe Rudy can help me, but I don't know. Voter fraud is, is an, an issue, you know, that needs to be uh, dealt with everywhere. I mean, if, if I knew for a fact that my vote will be stolen, I wouldn't even bother voting. I don't, th I don't think anyone would. Um, but there, there are ways to combat this, you know. There, there are ways to, uh, to, to address this issue. And civil society organizations in the DRC have come up with a multitude of activities uh, when it comes to uh, thwarting voter fraud. You can train people on uh, how to observe elections. You can um, have people uh, posted at uh, polling stations. There are several ways to uh, to uh, diminish the level of fraud, but you can't um, totally eradicate it. It's th that's not that's just not feasible. And the third question: um, When women run in office, how did they organize? Did they organize themselves? Um, to try to finding to have fun and you what know strategies the strategies um, I think it's very difficult because most of the time political parties in Congo doesn't give money to 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 women to to people and you know they have to find their own strategies to. Uh, finance their campaign, which is very difficult most of the time. So um, that, that, that's, um, that, that's way exclude uh, women who doesn't have money. And it's very, very difficult. But I think the other strategies for women um, who are running, you know, is also to try to work with men because most of the time, you know, they try to work alone and try to mobilize uh, other women. But, you know, through our training, we show them that men and women are potential uh, voters and they have to work with both to make sure that, you know, men can understand that they can trust in, in women and they can vote for them. But financially, it's always uh, difficult. Fundraising is, is uh, really important anywhere in politics. In the case of the DRC, political parties don't receive grants uh, from the state. In, in Europe, it's actually another uh, another reality. A lot of political parties uh, during elections receive something from the state. It's not the case in the DRC. The the largest political parties, you know, the main ones, uh, they tend to raise more funds than than uh, you know smaller parties, and of course they do uh, give some funds to uh, specific female candidates, but it, it's not enough to get a lot of them elected. If, you, if, if I can go over the stats, in the National Assembly, we, you only have 44 female members of parliament out of 492. It's a really small number. In the Senate, five women out of 108 senators. So it's clearly a uh, an issue of, of funding here being visible, and um, unfortunately, without the the backing of the of the party, 
you really can't do uh, a lot of fundraising. It's, it's a serious problem. Okay, our final round, this lady here, will ask, and Dave Peterson will ask the last two questions, and then we'll wrap up. Hi, uh, my name is Claire Anderson. I work with the Georgetown Institute for Women, Peace, and Security. Uh, thank you so much for sharing your story. Um, it's, it's really empowering or amazing to hear the stories of, of women that are working um, in these smaller rural areas to change their realities. Um, my question for you is in reference to the uh, s um, impunity and, um, and corruption that you referenced as a barrier. Um, and my question for you is whether um, women, especially in IDP camps in rural areas, view the lack of justice for perpetrators of sexual violence. Is that lack of justice a, a barrier to their participation economically or politically? Or is it seen more as something that maybe they tackle once they do have more access to economic or political power? Thank you. And the last word, last question to Dave Peterson of NED. Hi, hi, <coughs> Pasir. Uh, beyond uh, formal politics, uh, could you say a little bit about uh, women's involvement in uh, civil society? Uh, you know, I think uh, in particular, um, I mean, working with civil society throughout Africa, but certainly including Congo, uh, you know, there's so many NGOs, you go in and meet with them and it's all men. Uh, there are very few women that one generally finds involved in civil society. Uh, you know, we saw a film here uh, uh, a couple of days ago about uh, some of the protests in, in Brazzaville and, you know, with the citizen movements especially. Uh, so I just mentioned, you know, that one of the leaders of Lucha had uh, been killed. But, uh, uh, you know, in the film, you see these crowds of hundreds and hundreds of people protesting and there's almost no women. Uh, so, you know, could you say to what extent uh, uh, you have found some sort of um, uh, welcome from uh, the citizen movements and civil society in general for women, and how can you increase uh, women's participation in civil society? Two small questions for you, um, Rudy. Too small. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much for that question. Uh, the, the first one, Claire, um, about impunity and corruption in the uh, system, in Congo system. Um, yeah, I, I think the lack of justice uh, is something we have um, seen in, uh, in Congo specifically for survival of sexual and gender-based violence, for example. Uh, you know, with the system, you can, uh, they, they can go to justice, the perpetrators of sexual violence can go to justice, but after maybe two, three days or one week, you know, they can be released by the government. And in that time, for example, it's like um, a, serious security problem, you know, for different organizations who have been involved, you know, in that case to make sure that, you know, that person can be, uh, can go and pay, you know, for what he did. And uh, unfortunately, with that system, which is like corrupted, you know, it's very, very difficult. Sometimes most of women uh, who are victims of um, not only sexual violence, so many other cases, you know, they just decide sometimes to keep silence or, um, yeah, to try to do like uh, local mediation when there are so many problems of sexual violence. And for me, that is, you know, uh, unacceptable because, you know, those water of sexual violence have to be punished for what they, they, they did. And uh, unfortunately, we have a system which is really very corrupted. Most of the time, um, in rural areas, they can give a cow, a, uh, yeah, you know, they can give money and they can be released. And we, try, we, are, we are trying actually to make sure that, uh, you know, the justice can be 
uh, reinforced and you know they, they, they can uh, make sure that women and go and girls can have access to justice because most of the time the one as I said who has money are men and they can give money as they want but women are most of the time poor they don't have money even for justice if it's in terms of corruption I think I don't know I can't say that women are not corrupted but uh, yeah I think most of the time they are poor they don't have money um, Dave's question. This is a difficult question. Why we don't have women um, in protestation? Um, we see only uh, men and young people. I, I think it's, it's very, very difficult. In the civil society, as we said, we don't have um, more women. Women are, um, we have few. But I think there, there is different. There, there are different ways women are involved in uh, the peace process and different activities. Even myself, I ask myself most of the time why we don't have uh, women engaged because you know with the conflict, women are the first victims, and you know to keep silence about the situation which is currently happening in Congo, it's just unacceptable uh, for women. Uh, th that is why, for example, I'm in the process to try to create like a movement of women uh, to make sure that as women, we can be able, uh, you know, to try to work together to unify our strength and make sure that we can make our voice heard. Because, you know, um, sometimes when you are doing action, are doing something, it's okay. But I'm really sure, I truly believe that if women, you know, can go, for example, in the street, we have seen uh, example of Liberia and many other countries where women have been able to change the narrative. And I think for the Congo situation, women has to play an important role. And I uh, will try to work hard and make sure that, you know, this can be possible by, you know, uh, here I'm trying, you know, to create like a kind of network with other uh, women movement around the world and make sure that, you know, we can have, uh, yeah, support from other women and try to unify our voice. Well, Passy, on that note, let me say that you are extraordinary with a remarkable life story. Uh, most of all, your perseverance, your courage, and your spirit are inspirational. So thank you. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Thank you to Rudy. And thank, thank you, you to the audience for your participation and support.